Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gran van der Juffer, and I work for the South African Environmental Observation Networks, the Gagasini Node, based in Cape Town. And it is my honor and privilege to formally welcome the students, the fishermen, the scientists, and the general public alike to this evening's National Science Week webinar. This webinar is an initiative of the Department of Science and Innovation under the administration of SASTA, and it is hosted by Sayoni Gagasini Node and the Science Engagement Team. Personally, as someone who shares a close connection with the ocean, I am very excited about this webinar as it offers a unique platform for an informal educational discussion between the different role players utilizing South Africa's marine resources, as well as the students and the public who share an interest in the sector. I hope that this evening's discussions and the knowledge shared by our distinguished panel will be beneficial for everyone in attendance. So without further ado, I will now hand over to my colleague and your program chair for this evening, Mr. Thomas Ntonsi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grant. As Grant has just said, I am Thomas Ntonsi, and um, I will be the program director for the whole learning or educational platform this evening. And again, uh, I would like to echo his sentiments. Welcome to everyone. This is a unique style webinar that actually is going to involve conversations, really. Uh, you, you could just picture yourself uh, sitting with a friend uh, over a cup of tea, just talking about issues or uh, certain things, understandings. And there's great learning in conversations. Um, so we, we will organize it like that. We've invited uh, a, a number of role players, key role players in the fisheries uh, uh, sector to just share with us what happens in their lives and hoping that would uh, at this be a, a learning or an educational platform. Often you, you, you do get uh, a community meeting where just a particular stakeholder speaks to another. Um, and often you get um, quite a number of different ways in which people stakeholders engage. This, this particular one is, I want to emphasize a educational platform where we've looked at a number of role players. We, we're still missing quite a few, but we thought, uh, you know, uh, about eight, uh, you know, uh, key people who work in the industry differently can share different things. And hopefully that would uh, help us understand what happens at each other's uh, workplaces and day-to-day -day life. And so this is what it's going to be, just an educational platform and conversations. I'll do my best to direct the best questions uh, to the panel, uh, panelists, but I want to encourage you as well as part of the audience, please, when, if you have questions for any of the panelists that would, in fact, they will introduce themselves and tell you more what they do. Okay, please do just um, put some questions in the chat. Make sure that um, we, we will we'll record those questions and make sure that the, the panelists do offer some sort of reaction or responses to that, to the best of their ability, of course. Um, so you can direct a particular question. To, we will also, we will also forward you an opportunity at some stage once the panelists have exhausted some sort of uh, the discussions that we, will, we are going to have with them. We will also allow for you to have questions. You can unmute your mic at that stage and put questions to whomever you wish to. It could be someone uh, that is in the science aspect of the fisheries. It could be someone who's in the administration of that. It could be someone who does a different role or who actually just uh, they, their daily life and their livelihoods depend on it. So um, yeah, that's what we are going to do. I'm just trying to make sure that uh, the effects behind me are, are controlled. Okay, thank you. Um, 
At this point, I would now invite our uh, panelists in this manner. Uh, I'm first going to go to, um, because the first round is just introductions. Uh -huh. Right, I'm sure my colleagues are helping us just to make sure that we create a very good educational platform. Let us start with um, Professor Kerry Sink. If you could just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how your work relates to the fisheries industry, please, thank you. Hi, Thomas, uh, thanks and good evening to everyone. Um, I really appreciate this unique opportunity to, to meet others in the, the human ecosystem of fishing. I am a scientist at the South African National Biodiversity Institute or SANBI based in Kirstenbosch. And um, there I really work on three aspects of marine biodiversity and that's at the, the ecosystem level, the species level and even the genetic level. And um, my job is to, to understand and report on the state of marine biodiversity, including fisheries, we have more than 700 species that are harvested in South Africa. So yeah, that just to give you an idea. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, it seems like I, I could easily confuse your work with uh, one of our other panelists who I'm going to invite to speak to you for a second to, uh, to introduce themselves. Dr. Fanny Shabang. All right, thanks, Thomas. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Fan Shabang, as Thomas has said, and I'm a uh, fisheries scientist at the Department of, of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. And I work mainly with the small pelagic fish. By small pelagic fish, I'm referring to uh, anchovy, sardine, and round herring, or red eye. And we are uh, the people who are responsible for doing the research, which is used for recommending the quotas or yeah or the chasing or total allowable catches for the industry for the year and we mainly uh, on a normal basis interact with the industry and or industry association when we are working towards recommending those to chasing and doing research thank you funny um at this stage i would like to invite uh pairs if you could just truly introduce yourself and how your work, who you work for and how that relates to the fisheries. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the invitation, Sayon. Um, my name is Pavs. I work at WWF South Africa. I manage the SASI program, which is the Southern African Sustainable Seafood Initiative. And what we do there is we'll look at how do we shift consumption to more sustainable seafood. We work very closely uh, with government, other NGOs, because that's how we develop the SASI list, which is an easy traffic light system for people to make informed choices around the seafood that they consume. Um, so apart from the natural sciences, I also work in the behavioral sciences. In other words, how do we get people to change their choices? How do we get people to make smart purchases? And how do we get people overall to actually make what we call pro-environmental decisions when it comes to their everyday lives? Thanks, Thomas. Interesting. That sounds like uh, exciting things working there. I'm looking forward to hear more about it uh, in a bit. Uh, at this point, I would like uh, to invite Umza Mokaiba, please, to tell us about who he really is, what he does, and uh, how that relates. Why is he here this evening? Umza Okay, while Mzamo is connecting, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, at this point just quickly going to um, ask, uh, I think he is, yeah, Apiwe. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Apiwe Ngeneza. I'm currently working for the Department of uh, Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. 
Uh, right at the moment, I'm currently based uh, under the subdirectorate, which is called Pelagic and High Seas Fisheries Management. And strictly we deal with uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign fishing permits and uh, uh, tuna catch permits and large pelagic permits. Uh, my main part uh, is strictly is simply straightforward regarding that. It's uh, it's in relation to processing of uh, these permits and ensuring that we do all the reporting in terms of tuna regional tuna management organization organizations. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Apiwe. You all guys, you, you guys all have interesting things that you do. It looks like so much. So much happening in, fish, in, in fisheries. Uh, Tato? Thanks, Thomas, and uh, good evening to everyone. My name is Tato Tagheri, and I'm a data analyst at uh, INJ in Danger Point, France Um So the work I involved obviously involves the analysis of data from the different um, departments of the farm. Um, so there's obviously a relationship between the legal and the illegal um, harvesting of abalone. So uh, the illegal harvesting of abalone is quite prevalent in the, in the area where we operate. So we're not directly involved in the, um, in the wild harvesting of abalone, but there's obviously a relationship between the wild and the farm-based harvesting of the product. So uh, my talk will be based on, on that. Interesting. Thank you very much. Mzamo, I see you back on. Thank you. Uh, if you could just tell us about uh, what you do and where you do it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Program Director. My name is Mzamo. I'm, uh, I've been working as a Fisheries Observer since 2003. Uh, we work on the South African Observer Fisheries Program. We also work on other management programs, like managed uh, programs. We also work. We also do uh, work of observers on the fish, which is uh, um, harvested uh, closer to Antarctica. Okay, Mzamo, uh, I know so you. basically we are collecting. Sorry, Mzamo, I know your work is really important and we don't want to miss any of what you are introducing us to. If you could just at this moment, uh, just find a spot. We really want to benefit for, from your inputs. Um, we we okay. do Can seem to have it. Just, just, a, just a minute, Mzamo, we do have a little challenge with your bandwidth at the moment. Um, okay. Do you want okay. to try with stopping your video and then you you just if you just stop your video we, maybe you'll come across my much clearer thanks okay okay how is it now that's better okay. Okay. okay, Mzama, uh, we, we're gonna have to come back to you. Uh, okay, can, if you can help me with Mzama for a second. Um, just, if Mzama, we're gonna come back to you. Working in the different fisheries. Um, in the past, that's where, okay. Okay, Mzamo, okay, me... we, Mzamo we, we're gonna come back to you just now. I do have a plan for you, um, but let, let's just uh, let you um, try you know, a better position at the moment. I, I would like at this point quickly, please to uh, invite um, Mr. Clarence Smith uh, uh, to just introduce himself as well say who he is and what, uh, how he is related to the fishing industry. Mr. Clarence? Mr. Clarence? Okay. What's happening here? Yeah. <laughs> 
Hi, hi. Is it okay, Mr. Smith? Hey, everybody. Hi, hi. Is it okay, Mr. Smith? Yeah, I think it's okay now. Um, my name is Karen Smith, and I'm from Hunger Bay. I'm a local fish, and we are in the Fisherman is a very rock. Okay, Mr. Smith, we, 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 we heard part of what you said, and there was something important about rock. rock. Um, I'm going to also ask that maybe um, I'm going to just in a second. Um, we, we do need to get some support for you uh, so that you are sorted out. We're very interested in what you uh, have to offer for us this evening as an input. Um, but at the moment, there's a bit of background uh, uh, echo, and we just want to make sure that you, we don't want to miss any of the things that you are going to mention. I think it's so very important. Uh, we're going to try again in a bit. But can I just ask uh, your namesake? There's also a young man, Clarence Daniels, who's part of this conversation this evening. And I'm probably going to speak to some of the uh, information that has been missed because of network and the challenges of the virtual space just in a moment. Uh, but Clarence Daniels, can you maybe introduce yourself, sir? Hi, I'm Clarence Daniels. And... I am a marine science student. I grew up in a coastal city called Hout Bay. It's a very beautiful town where I learned a lot of what I know. And also some of my family members are fishermen. Mother grew up working in fabric. So I have quite a huge background when it comes to fishing. Yeah. And you went to pursue marine sciences. That's very interesting, Clarence. I'm looking forward to chat to you more about uh, that. Thank you very much. Um, so we've missed a bit about what Umzamo Makaiba was saying. And as I understand, Umzamo is a uh, fisheries observer. I know Umzamo from a time he presented at a Marine and Coastal Educators Network Conference back in 2005, I think it was, in Durban. And for the first time, I got to know that uh, his work includes um, doing observ ob observations at sea. And I was hoping you could take us through that. And I, I, I still hope that he, his network will clear a bit because uh, there's quite a bit, he's so experienced and it's been so many years. We'd like to, to look into a lot of what happens at sea to taking it from there and to what happens in the restaurant with a plate of food. We've, if you noticed, you, you may have seen that we have quite a variety of different stakeholders. Um, who are here today to offer a bit of uh, input. So at this stage, um, naturally, I would really want to speak to Mr. Clarence Smith, who is the fisherman. And, and I'm hoping that they would have solved the, the background there. I have just a few questions that I want to put to him uh, at, at this point. Uh, Mr. Clarence Daniels, if you, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Clarence, uh, sorry, uh, Clarence, just come on again. Just come on again. Okay, so I'm going to ask that uh, you, you just stop your video and if there's another device that is on, it would help the echo. So there isn't echo, we can just have the benefit of your thoughts, your wisdom, uh, the information that you would be sharing with us. Uh, only if your mic is unmute and any other devices that may be there, in the people that may be supporting you or so on, uh, maybe they are, if they can 
those devices should not be part of 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 because then the the feedback will be there. So once again, sir, I I did hear you talk a little bit about uh, uh, rock lobster, but um, and and in fact, it would have been my question to say, what is it that you really fish as a fisherman in a how bay, and how long have you been doing this? Uh, so if you could speak to that. Um, maybe you could also include who do you do this with? Are they, do you do it with some friends, family members, or is there some people also in, uh, you know, in the neighborhood that you do that? Do you own a boat? Maybe you can also just tackle that aspect while you edit. it. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All right. Um, all right. There's still some help uh, to enable Mr. Smith to really help us with some sort of um, understanding on how his how a typical day of a fisherman is, so that we can benefit from that. Um, let me bring back. Uh, I, I did okay, Mr. Smith. You seem to be already great. I, I see the name and then see Mr. Smith, so this should work. Brilliant. Thank you to my colleague there, Posisa. Mr. Smith, okay. The the question that I was putting to you is help us understand um, how long you've been doing this. A bit of history in that. And uh, do you do you own a boat? Do you do this with family? Or uh, do you do this with friends or neighbors? Um, I'm sure uh, looking at uh, there's quite a bit of wisdom within game. Thanks, sir. I think there's a problem with sound now. Um, the positive, if you could just help there. Right, let's bring in Tato at the moment. So, so we'll come back to Mr. Smith. Tato mentioned something about farming. Um, Tato? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Tato. Um, so, so I, I, I really wanted to understand your work and for someone who has no, for a student maybe may have not necessarily come from a fishing community. And you, you know, some of the students that are doing marine science may actually even come from a Gauteng or somewhere inland. Uh, can you bring in farming with uh, the type of work you do in relation to uh, fisheries and just paint a good picture to us? Uh, maybe you can take us through a typical day uh, in the life of Tato Kaki. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Thomas. Um, so uh, the work I do is, is uh, I, I don't think I'm not sure if a lot of people know about uh, what Avalon is, but I would imagine a lot of people like the ones you've alluded to, those from Jovek or places like that, they they may not, not know what what an Avalon is, but basically an Avalon is. Um, a, a marine snail. I'm trying. I'm just trying to um, to share my screen so that I can show you that. So, uh, okay. So I just uh, just a moment. I'm just trying to. Okay. So this is. I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Tato, we can. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So so this is an abalone. This is what an abalone looks like. So basically, this is um, a marine species, which means it lives in, in, in seawater. So what we do at the farm is, um, I think a lot of people, when they hear about INJ, they think about fishing and, um, and, and stuff like that, and beef patties. 
But ANJ also owns uh, an Avalon farm based in, in Hansbar next to Amanis. So um, the work that I do involves analysis of uh, data for, for the company. Uh, we have various departments uh, at different stages to, to, to Avalon production within the farm, starting from the nursery all the way to, to grow up. So at each and every one of those stages, there is um, quite a lot of data that is generated that, and is required to make decisions, to drive business decisions. So I analyze all of the data coming out of those different departments. But um, from time to time, we do get involved in community initiatives that involve um, teaching primary school children about Avalon poaching. And that's because we do have some outreach programs in which we get involved in the local communities. So we do talk about Avalon poaching as part of that. And the reason we do that is because uh, the issue is quite, is quite prevalent in the community where the farm is based. So it's, no, we're not directly involved, like I said in the beginning, in the wild harvest of the species. We are a farm-based operation, but we do get involved in um, community initiatives where Avalon um, initiatives are, are undertaken. Right. Thank you, uh, uh, Tato. Um, that's quite interesting. Uh, I think uh, you, you helped us with a picture as well so that we we can get uh, you know a, a good picture of 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 your work um of course you know inj and uh, your farming you know, I, I couldn't reconcile the two so thank you to you for for explaining that um thank you so much uh let's bring in quickly um dr shabangu Often you are at sea doing quite a number of surveys. Uh, the other time when we made contact, you were at sea. What is it that you really do from your, how, how do you really, uh, you know, meet those objectives? What does what you do at sea help uh, your work? And don't take for granted that we, 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 I'm not assuming, you know, everyone knows what you do. And so uh, just paint that really clearly for us. We, we really want to know when you go out and do the field work, where does your work go? Why should we care about it? Thanks. All right, thanks, Thomas. Uh, um, uh, all right, I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. So the objectives of fisheries management is to manage the stocks in or the fish stocks uh, in a sustainable way as a title of this uh, webinar. And for us to do that, we have objectives, which some of them are economic and then we have social and political and have biological. So by economic, uh, uh, objectives we mean those that for the fishery for it to function in a in a viable way they have to make money and in a biological way we have to be able to keep the stock in a in a healthier way so that it can be sustainable and we can be able to have fish for for a long time or for many years to come and then social and political that's when we talk about deployment social economic and uh, the political influence in terms of, uh, as I said, we recommend cases and those are decision made by our management as to whether the science, the recommendation by, by scientists are taken into consideration and applied in the management of stocks in South Africa. So we have our, our main mandate or my, my main mandate as a pelagic uh, fishery scientists to look into the uh, into tree stocks, which is sardine, anchovy, and, and red eye, and we do sur surveys, two surveys per year, one in winter that looks into the recruits. Uh, as the name says, those are eventually recruited and they become bigger, later they become the bigger fish, which will be the biomass and the spawn. And we have another survey in November where we look into the biomass of those uh, big fish. And based on the surveys which we have, the results from some such surveys where we do to get a picture of, uh, of the structure or the abundance of the fish in South African waters. So we usually start our surveys all the way from the border between South Africa and Namibia, 
all the way to um, Port Alfred, and sometimes it goes as far as Port St. John's, depending on time and weather allowances. So based so on those- simple things. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no, just, no, I was just gonna uh, interrupt you for a second. Say, so in simple terms, I've acquired uh, the word management in your explanation from all of the work that you do. And in simple terms, you do all this work and it, uh, because my next question to you really was, how does this help the community? But you mentioned the social aspects and, uh, you know, to make sure there's, there's enough. My, my direct question really would have been, uh, you as a scientist, um, how do you actually help What's your relationship with the fish, with the managers? Uh, are you a, a part of the people who decide how this should be managed or do you just feed into them? And how does your work also further help the fishing communities maybe? Uh, all right, thanks, Thomas. Yeah, so our, our, my work directly helps in terms of uh, informing the managers how much fish can be allocated to the industry for a particular year for it to be sustainably so that they can have more fish in the future and not just uh, harvest as much fish as we can today and we don't have fish, fish in, the, in the next 10 or so years. So we do our research to inform management in that way so they can have that sustainable use and also have uh, the industry in a sustainable way. So as you ask Clarence, if he has a boat, if somebody has bought a boat, you're investing, you have, you have to have some kind of insurance that you'll be able to generate income for the next 20 years, depending on the loan you got from the bank. So for one to have that, we have that, that sustainability in, in place and whoever as a as the industry employs so many people they will have to have also that sec social security and have their houses we have a bond with the bank and also have that security that we will have enough income coming from this pelagic uh, uh, industry which is employing uh, so many people in in uh, around the coast of South Africa. And so in short, that's how the community could be benefiting from or benefits from our work. And we ensure as such when the sustainability, sustainability in terms of harvesting, there's also food security, as many people have seen in when they go to shops. I'll not mention any, any brand, but you have seen those sardines and packaged in red and white uh, uh, cans. Many will be familiar with those and those are mainly fish feed many of the impoverished uh, uh, communities in South Africa. So that's how our work directly or indirectly influence the economy and also uh, affect the, uh, the population of South Africa. Thanks, uh, Fanny. I do uh, hope that uh, if you are in the audience and you do have a question uh, for some of our panelists that have uh, shared a little bit about what they do here that you will leave that question in the chat. Uh, Kerry, I want to just come to you and say, and then I'm, I'm not sure if I should really put this question to you, but uh, now more than ever, I want to, uh, what would you say is the state of affairs? Um, what understanding uh, could you give us about the state of affairs fisheries just in general, just, from where you sit and uh, what you do. You are on mute, Kerry. Thanks, I Thomas. Um, sure. So, no, I think the, the fisheries department is the right department to answer this question, but what we do at the National Biodiversity Institute is bring together many different data sources to report on the state of biodiversity. And as I said, we've got more, more than 700 species that are actually fished by a whole diversity of fishing cultures in the country. And actually, I would say that there's a lot we don't know. So for, 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 more, than, for more than 80 to 90% of those species, we don't have up-to-date information on the state of the stocks. And then for the remaining, um, I would say that 
we know that where we do have updated stock assessments, it's not in a very good state. Uh, many of our resources are overexploited, about a third. A third of our fisheries resources where there is a stock assessment are reported as overexploited. And inshore resources like abalone and West Coast rock lobster um, in our most recent national biodiversity assessment were reported as in crisis with um, poaching um, really preventing recovery of these resources and threatening the livelihoods and, and jobs of legitimate fishers. Thanks, Gary. I, I, I do want to just stay with you for a second. And uh, my reasons for doing that is, uh, yeah, at some point I, I thought maybe it would be unfair to put this question to you, but thanks for your reaction. Uh, you have some experience and uh, maybe you've written some reports, technical research reports on environmental impacts maybe uh, or anything related. This is just um, dealing with government, uh, dealing with um, things that would become policy. And uh, how would you then say your your work has been welcomed to those recommendations, uh, you know, from your reports? Uh, are they often taken full or are they uh, aspects that are often not necessarily uh, fully taken or considered? Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I would say that the full range of responses exist. There are some recommendations that I've been involved in that have had no uptake, and then there's some that have been fully taken up. But no, I think science, and particularly natural science, is only one input that the managers need to consider. So you can make what we would call a science-based recommendation. And in fisheries, we, we worried about the reality of resource abundance, but um, the other elements in terms of who fishes um, and, and all those issues, there are many social justice issues and complexities that, that managers need to consider. So you know, what we might see as a, as a science-based opinion is only one informant and I'm sure our colleagues uh, from the fishers to the managers can can reflect on that. Great. I uh, just to let you, before I let you go, uh, and this is just the last uh, uh, part that I want to put to you. And I, your your work, understandably, has been a lot around MPAs, uh, marine marine protected areas. Um, and how do those contribute to sustainable fisheries? Care to share a bit of light there? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Yes, um, I, I've been really involved in the development of what we call offshore marine protected areas. And um, it's actually less complex than coastal and inshore resources where there's more pressure and complexity. But I think there's four or five key areas where marine protected areas can make a difference. So first of all, we know that um, in some parts of the ocean where we can stop fishing, so some no-take zones can play a role in resource sustainability. It's not true of all resources, but for, for many fish, fish are not like humans. Uh, for many species of fish, the older the fish is, the more it actually reproduces. And often, more often with those babies, the eggs might have a higher fat content. So it makes a disproportional uh, contribution to fisheries. So this is not true for all resources, but for many resources, the, the stocks can build up in unfished areas and then spill over into adjacent areas, making a direct contribution. Then protected areas uh, also help manage the broader ecosystem. So for example, looking after some fragile habitat types or animals that form home for other animals or hiding places, for young fish, juvenile or nursery areas. So by looking after those areas, the nursery areas or the breeding grounds, you can support fisheries management. And then they can also play a key role if you have very threatened species um, that in, in looking after threatened species um, and then also you know, other aspects like tourism, 
um, other things that contribute to the ocean economy. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kerry. I'm gonna invite uh, um, Pavs and I do want to say that in, in a bit uh, that we will give uh, members of the audience here uh, opportunities to put questions. But if there are some burning things and uh, you, you could put them in the chat as well as we go along. Perhaps you, you stated a little bit about what SASI means and, uh, and you gave us a little bit of, uh, you know, and some people may have forgotten here, but I, 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 I really hope that you can just really bring out, highlight uh, the objectives of this initiative. Um, and at the one point, I look at uh, 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 conservation and I look at assessment and maybe you could use those as well to uh, help us understand your objectives very well. Sure, thanks Thomas, yeah. So, I mean, Sassy, uh, so I'd, I always like to start at one point, you know, you get the leg regulatory mechanisms that drive fisheries management, which is usually government policy legislation, uh, you know, your quotas, your tech, etc. And then SASI comes from the other end, and it's a non-regulatory mechanism to help with a regulatory mechanism. So they must never be seen as two separate. They're actually supposed to help each other to safeguard our oceans resources and for better management of our fisheries. Uh, with SASI in particular, we're starting at the consumer and we're working up the supply chain as opposed to starting at legislation and working down the supply chain. So SASI has two big components and lots of people don't understand that, is that it has a component that works with consumers and then it has a component that works with retailers and suppliers. And both those components are underpinned by the science that sits underneath SASE. And, and I'm very lucky to have people like Kerry um, who sit on the review board and they give the science on which the SASE listing is based, um, rigor, robustness, and credibility, because it is based on relevant peer-reviewed publication. It is a very easy system whose idea is how do we shift seafood consumption patterns and production practices to be more sustainable. And what we do is we've got some main objectives when it comes to SAS and as to A, increase consumer awareness. But, you know, being aware is great, Thomas, as you know. Lots of us are aware of don't eat so much chocolate, don't have so much coffee. But whether we act on it is a completely different story. So the second part of, of SASE is how do we get people to start acting on that awareness? And that is by giving people tools, because it's all well and good to tell somebody not to do something, but you have to show them how. And SASE comes up with a suite of tools. So the second objective is how do we develop pathways that enable people to make those smart choices? And then the third one, which is the scientific base of it, is that how do we protect and look after those species that are of conservation concern? And as you know, WWF is a strong conservation bedrock on which it sits. And how then do we manage and consume those species that are all right, but do it in such a way that we actually look after those species and that we don't get to a point where they become uh, species we want to put on, on our orange or red list. The mechanism that SASE uses is a traffic light system. It's a red, orange, green system. It's very easy. It is very much based on precautionary. So we'd rather earn the side of, of actually being overly cautious than come to a point where a species is in such trouble that we have to red list it. So you know, if, if we, the, the different categories allow you to consume differently. So if it's on the green list, we say, go ahead, you know, there's, we've looked at impact, we've looked at management, we've looked at ecosystems impact to the fisheries, we've looked at the stock levels of those fisheries, and they seem to be okay. Um, there's some man there's management in place, the stock seem to be all right under fishing pressure, and they would get a green listing. And then if you get an orange listing, you know, I don't, I usually tell people, we don't say don't eat orange, I just say don't eat it every time you go out to eat it, <laughs> uh, because there are some concerns there. And we're working on those species and those concerns can range in those categories. And then the final list, which is obviously the red list, where we ask people to stay away from because those species are in real trouble. The understanding of that is that if we shift consumption patterns, which then shift what retailers and suppliers then purchase, making their supply chains more sustainable, you then shift towards responsible fisheries production. And when you can do that, you then see change 
on the water. So that is the whole objective of SASE and its entire uh, theory of change. So, you know, very often people look from boat to plate. I look from plate to boat. Uh, so I work slightly up the supply chain as opposed to most people that work down the supply chain. And that's the premise of SASE, you know, and that's the natural science bedrock that sits and kind of creates that scientific rigor for SASE. But there's another component which lots of people don't understand, and that's the behavioral component. It is very all, it's, you know, it's an exceptionally wonderful program. I mean, Kerry is the founder of that program so many, many years ago. She conceptualized and brought the idea to life and, and WWF then took it over. Um, you know, it's great to have that very strong natural science. Where we understand that. But if you work with lay people, consumers, retailers, suppliers, you've got to use the behavior component. And that's where the behavioral science comes in. How do we get people to make those smart choices or what we'd like to call those pro-environmental decisions? And this is not asking someone to change their whole life because that will never happen. It is asking them to change aspects of that life, of their lives that allow for environmental benefit. So in terms of SASE, it's making that smart choice in terms of how much seafood you consume, where you consume it, understanding where it is from and understanding how it was caught or farmed. Because as you know, as Tato alluded to it and Kerry alluded to it, not all fishing methods are equal and not all fish are equal. <laughs> so you've got to balance those components really carefully when we put a fish species on the list. Brilliant. Thanks, Pevs. I see my mic going on and off there for a second. Um, no. Sure. No, no, thank you. Um, my you 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 alluded to it. I was going to ask about the part of how how reliable how how trusted is the science that informs your approach. Um, of course, uh, a lot of people who you deal with the, the consumer at restaurants and so on. Uh, you you know, just the the questions and the some of the 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 loopholes they might want to look at. Can the science be trusted that uh, you base your, your, your list or your assessment on and so on? Uh, is there something that you just want to say towards that? Absolutely. So, so the science is peer reviewed. Um, you know, it's, I, I often have to tell people it's not a bunch of scientists or WWF staff sitting around a hat, pulling out a species and deciding which color the, <laughs> the fish is, which listing. It, it actually can take us up to a year to do one assessment. It is based on an internationally recognized methodology called the Common Assessment Methodology. And it looks at three key, three key elements. It looks at the stock. In other words, what's the biology of this fish? What is happening with its numbers? Um, and then it looks at the ecosystem's impact of the fishery. And then find it looks at the management. And all of that information is drawn from verified, published, peer-reviewed data, as well as something that sets us a little bit apart from other uh, rating systems, Thomas, and that, you know, we're very fortunate that we have a very amicable marine science community. So, you know, we, we sit on the working groups at TFFE, we participate as observers within those scientific working groups, and we have access to a broad range of scientists, whether they're government scientists or independent academia. So we use all of those resources and the best available science to actually underpin which and how we then rate the species. And just to be extra safe, we then have an external review panel of academics and scientists, and we give industry and government the opportunity to actually comment on the colors before we finalize it. So there's a long process involved when you actually end up with that specific color for a specific species. Thanks, Pevs. Um, before we, we entertain more questions from uh, the audiences and so on, I do want to bring back at least two people. Um, I'd like to bring back Mr. Clarence Smith. I think there was quite a bit that uh, we, we could have um, looked into and I mentioned that it is wisdom in the in the fisheries and would, would benefit us quite a bit, Mr. Smith. Um, I, I hope your your 
is this technology sometimes does give us challenges, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you are this it's a bit better. So initially, I just uh, wanted to know from you um, how what your 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 fishing experience is. What do you use? How do you go about it? And I, I know you mentioned the rock lobster at some point, but you probably want to give us a little bit more, including just really taking us, uh, you know, uh, walk us through a typical day of a fisherman and all its challenges and its successes, in fact. Thanks. Thanks for this opportunity, Thomas. I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Very well, and it's, it's much, much better. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. I've been, <clears throat> I'm born and bred here in Nangberg, Hout Bay. Born into a, a fishing family. My father was a fisherman, brother a fisherman. My mother, three sisters, they all working, worked in the fishing industry. So I basically grew up in a, in a fishing environment. And so my, 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 my neighbors, my friends, families, other uh, related families, they were all involved in the industry. So that um, I went to, in 1976, um, I started going to, to, to sea, uh, just on a weekly, uh, weekend basis, you know. And um, I started to adopt a, a love for the sea and, and I got involved in the industry 37 years back. So um, I'm basically a, a, a fisherman. I, could, I can call myself a fisherman because um, that is my life right now. And I could feed my family and uh, I could live uh, basically from day to day. Um, yeah, there are quite a few challenges. And we, my, what we actually uh, catch at sea as a, fisher, a local fisherman, um, I'm a, a handline fisherman catching mostly snook. And snook migrates from areas to areas. So um, you don't actually go out to sea on a daily basis in one place. So Hout Bay is not at the moment for quite a few years. Hout Bay hasn't seen a season of snook as yet. And uh, West Coast Rock Lobster, that is part of our, uh, our sectors that we, that we uh, allocated. And uh, yeah, that is, we, that is basically what we uh, were permitted to get from the sea or harvest from the sea, um, uh, um, Thomas. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Smith. I, I, I was hoping to just keep you, but I, I, I can also see that there may be a little bit of a, a challenge with the, the bandwidth. Um, and uh, Chief Regan James, sir, we will come to the questions. I promise you will have an opportunity. Um, and I've noted your enthusiasm wanting to participate. I appreciate that very much. Um, Mr. Smith, just before uh, I let you go, I, I, I do just uh, want to check with you because you talk about uh, such a long, you know, you know, it's, it's a great experience you've had over long years of service. It's, and so what do you think have changed over the years for you? Um, how do you understand, um, have you noticed different uh, differences in your fishing experience over this many years that you have been at it? And what do you think are the causes of that? Often we, we, we listen to career and we listen to funny and we, we get a lot of under scientific understanding, but I think it's important to get uh, your experiences uh, and, and uh, so that our information can be richly, uh, um, you, you know, we can have all, all, all aspects of information of people who have lived this and experienced this, who can share from um, those challenges and those, those, those successes they've had over the many years. But also, they uh, do indicate um, what, how things have changed over time. I say that because I don't. I, don't want to, I, I, I say that because I don't just want to accept uh, uh, climate change and many other things that get mentioned without hearing what what your what your view is. Thank you. 
Oh, well, Thomas, uh, scientifically, I can't explain the behavior of, of, of the snook, which is, which is our main um, fishing sector um, for hand line. Um, I can't explain their behavior, but it migrates from, 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 from area to area. And as I mentioned, we haven't had a season here in, 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 in Hard Bay, Hamburg, for quite a few years. And um, we've been traveling from, from here to Stomdes Bay, St. Helena Bay on the West Coast, Lamberts Bay on the West Coast, and even Northern Cape as far as Port Nulleth. And that is quite a challenge for us for traveling so far because expense, traveling expenses is, is, is way too much for us. So it, it, it's difficult for, for a fisherman coming from, from where we are staying, um, Hard Bay, to travel all the way that far and to go live that far and to go fish that far. And um, after all that, um, you know, at the end of the day, you are being exploited by either the fisherman, I mean, the, the, the boat owner or the fish monger, uh, uh, monger who buys the fish. Uh, he's normally called the langana in, you know, in, in the life of a fisherman. So, so, so it, it's difficult because um, you have to, when you, when you uh, travel so far to go, to go execute your job, then it's difficult to, to, to survive because um, the expenses are way too much. Because you have to live, you have to eat, you have to buy tackle and um, all that. And, 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 and um, the, the deductions at the end of the day, you don't actually earn anything. Mm. So, so, but for the love of the, uh, the job that you're doing, you, 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 you go with your crew and you go, it doesn't matter which way they're going, you go with them. Um, it's, a, it's a means of survival, Thomas. So, so um, yeah, but scientifically, I can't explain why fish doesn't come to our area anymore. Why fish does uh, migrate from area to area? And um, also, there's another thing that we've uh, observed is that um, in the deep, way out in the deep where the slip trawlers is working, they, they're getting a lot of uh, what we're supposed to catch here on, on the coast. Um, the we, we're supposed to catch that and they uh, get a lot of those species in their, in their, slip, in their nets. And, um, you know, most of that stuff doesn't, we don't benefit from that. And I think there should, there should be a change in, 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 in making decisions that the, the local fishermen and the local community, fishing communities should benefit from those. I hear you very well. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to ask you, um, what is your favorite dish, sir? This is just beside the point. Just... <laughs> My favorite dish is bubuti, and it's got nothing to do with seafood. With fish. Okay. Uh, would you would you consider a different career if there were many alternatives? Um, I know you said moment, uh, you uh, love Thomas. It. Yeah, at the moment, Thomas, as a means of survival, you have to you have to uh, um, indulge in something else to 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 provide for your families. Because the fishing industry is, is, is at the moment not sustaining sustainable, and neither is it viable for um, for you for yourself to 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 to, to help your family or feed your families. Th thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, we we probably will 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 come back to you at some point. Um, just I'm I'm going to allow for the audiences to put some questions across. However, uh, I thought the observer would have been someone quite important for us to hear from. Um, and I know there were some technical challenges. Uh, Mzamo, do you, do you think maybe you could uh, try again just for a second? Otherwise, we're going to go to um, the audiences just to deal with some questions. We have promised some questions, so we have to take some. Is Zama is still with us? Okay. Um, or maybe it's uh, up to him. I, I know um, much, a lot of things have been said around the work that you do by the other role players who maybe feed into it or work around that. 
So, so um, can we invite uh, a peer to just speak to us, please? Um, we, we, we want to know what he deals with in the day-to-day, -day. Uh, you know, you're sitting there in the administration aspect of it. What are the considerations in your day-to-day -day job, uh, Apiwe? Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, as I have introduced myself earlier, uh, my name is Apiwe and my surname is Nongeneza. I'm a senior administrative officer uh, under the sub-directorate called uh, Pelagic and High Seas Fisheries Management. Yes. Yeah, um, Pelagic and High Seas Fisheries Management, we deal uh, mainly with tuna like species, uh, large pelagic species, and we also deal with uh, foreign vessels that comes, I mean, on a daily basis to, to our country for, obviously, for, for different reasons. But in terms of in terms of my my, my duties as, as the senior administrative officer, um, one of the things that I I do on a daily basis it is to uh, to verify the work which have been submitted uh, to the directorate. Um, uh, I mean uh, permit applications and 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 stuff. And, and also, it also includes um, uh, reporting on a monthly basis to uh, regional fishery management organizations. Uh, remember, every, every species or every fish that's caught, uh, because we, countries have agreed uh, in terms of, of and clause um, 87, uh, countries have actually agreed to to ensure that there is <clears throat> the the con the, converse, the conversation the conservation of uh, marine uh, species uh, is controlled and monitored. So it is also our uh, mandate or duty as the department to ensure that uh, we, we 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 report uh, these uh, species that are that are getting caught so that at least the future generation that is to come has got something to, to catch. So, so, so we, we also do that. But on the administrative side, uh, it, is all, it is also important to note that uh, in terms of uh, getting the documents from, uh, from our industry, uh, it's something that you do on a daily basis and, and it's something that uh, you get used to because obviously every day there's a permit to uh, to process and and verify, and after that you 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 forward it to to to, to the client. So I just thought I, sh I, sh I just thought that I should um, uh, give a, just a brief uh, background for someone who doesn't understand or who doesn't know uh, what is it exactly that pelagic and Isis fisheries deals with. So we deal we do. Uh, tuna, tuna permits, uh, large pelagic permits. Uh, we also do uh, gear permits, which which is where we normally um, uh, allow or uh, when when foreign vessels have requested to to enter our exclusive economic zone, then obviously they must be permitted to to do so. So we also do such permits. So uh, it's something that we do on a daily basis, and it's. Um, it's a, it's a it's a it's a very important job. Thank you. Thanks, Apiwa. Would you say uh, the implementations of many of the policies that you you implement? Do you think that they are working? You don't have to. You can say yes or no. It's okay. Just checking. Would you feel like yes. everything is working well? Yes, they are working. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I did promise that we will go to. Um, the questions and there has been, uh, you know, a, a real interest to, to actually engage from that front. I will come back to you, Clarence Daniels, just after this. Um, thank you very much and all the comments that we are getting. Thanks, Brenda. 
Faiz Pochenpul, uh, sir, I've noted your your hand uh, uh, there. The first thing that I actually would want to allow for before we come to uh, the audiences is if any of the panel members, if, for example, Mr. Smith, you have, um, if Mr. Smith, you have uh, a question on any of your fellow panelists here, or uh, Clarence Daniels, if you have a question, or if perhaps you have a question to Mr. Smith, or Apiwe, and so on. So, or Kerry, if you have a question to, to, I would like to allow for that. And I only have a few minutes for that. Then we're going to the audiences. Uh, any of the panelists do, wanting to just uh, check in more with their fellow panelists? I will just get um, okay. Fanny's attention there. Eh? Oh, oh, all right, um, Mr. Smith. Before you go, I just want to note you will be first, and then uh, then I'll give Kerry next. Is anybody else want to say something, Fanny? Do you? Or obviously, you are being called to say Tato also wants, or is applaud is either applauding or is saying you would want to go. All right, okay, Mr. Smith, you go. I just want to, want to ask Fanny there if it if it is at, at all possible that we can exchange communication um, details like um, internet details, um, email, and contact details because he mentioned a, a few um, interesting factors that. Um, we might be as a fishing community might be interested in because it, it might uh, help us in our future prospects. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Mr. Smith, we definitely can make sure that uh, we, there's communication between you and Fanny, definitely. You can rest assured you'll have that as I leave. Uh, Fanny, do you want to say anything? Uh, Not no, really. You, so you had yeah. it for your. Yeah, for your I'll be able to. I'll be happy to engage with Mr. Smith. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I would actually like to to uh, pick up on one of the questions that the, an audience members ask, which is, where do we need to do better um, across this different this different human ecosystem involved in fisheries? I'm interested to hear from other panelists what we think we need to do better. Thanks. Great, there you go. Um, and you, you're you not going to pick anyone, Kerry, because if you leave it open, uh, we might all just say nothing. Oh, so perhaps. Yeah, sure. I'd, li I'd like to respond to, to Kerry's question. And I think it ties in. Uh, I mean, a lot of the questions in the chat uh, require me to <laughs> explain a lot. So I think this will help. So I think we're definitely, Kerry, where we need improvement is a lot of our smaller non-commercial industrialized fisheries, they're very fragmented and we need ways of, of bringing them together because what one of the things that we lack is viable data to be able to look at the species at every level, whether it be at a small scale level or a commercial level. And by bringing fishers together and basically being able to get more usable data, we, we, you know, we have long data sets for the commercial fisheries, but not necessarily for all the fisheries. So for me, it's basically getting that data so it looks at better management. And then also for uh, you know, another one, it, management has to be very closely linked um, and very closely tied to enforcement. Um, and we need to do better on that level as well. Thank you. Um, thanks, Pabs. Uh I think Tato also had his hand, uh, or either he was giving an applause. Tato, quickly. Thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, to raise my hand, but I only have two reactions here. It's just uh, okay. ping in the sure. chat. So there you are. Sure what's the, here. the platform okay, is so, yours. Thank you. I just have a question for, for Kerry, and um, I think Kerry, you did allude to, to the work that you do in terms of policy advice. Um, so, and um, oh, I think you heard how Mr. Smith feels. So in those decisions, there are quite a lot of things that do need to be taken into account. You do have the, source, the social element, you have the, um, the environmental element, and the other thing that's important to these fisheries is uh, the economic element of, of, of this management system. And I think these issues do tend to be um, 
a big issue in places like the Hout Bay, if you've noticed with the uh, rock lobster fishery, and uh, Mr. Smith has just alluded to how he feels about being left out of the fishery because uh, the big players are taking all of the fish out of the ocean and there's nothing coming inside. So um, I think this has been a complicated issue for quite a long time now. I remember uh, a few years while I was doing my honors, there were these issues, there were quite big protests in the Hout Bay area because of, um, of such issues. How has that, um, the policy making decision changed over the, couple of, the last couple of years in, in relation to this? And how do you see um, this panning out in the future? Thanks. Um, so I'm actually not a policymaker. I'm, I'm a scientist and I was reflecting on, on all the challenges that um, the decision makers have. Uh, so, so that is not one for me, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, and especially the complexities of the small scale fisheries policy, uh, which I know is fraught with challenges. So I'm not sure who's best place to discuss fisheries policy, but it's not me in the Biodiversity Institute, sorry. Sure, thanks, Kerry. And I may not have helped that when I had uh, put you in a spot for a question that that dealt a little bit. That was the responsibility of the fish. Uh, Apiwa, do you want to maybe uh, respond to that if there's anything or there is? Or oh, Apiwa is probably just dealing with some other question in the chat, uh, which is awesome because he would have had to do that in many cases. Apiwa, do you want to maybe respond to Tato if, if you have anything? or you may not have been best place as well for that. Um, Shabango is someone who works a lot with the policymakers in, from your end. Uh, is, do you have any reaction? Right, uh, yeah, I might, yeah, I can try. Uh, just like Kerry, I'm also a scientist. I don't uh, make policies as such, uh, um, yeah. I guess it's a, it's a tricky one for us to answer as a scientist because we do so much, as uh, Pezzo said, there's so much research has been done in South Africa and we continue to do more and some of it is not implemented. So is science enough by itself or we need more than, more than science? So that's a question that uh, maybe uh, policymakers, we, we should have, have one one of the policymakers in this panel to help answer some of those questions. So unfortunately I will, yeah. But while I have the platform- yeah, No, that's to, fair. Oh, sure, yeah, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. To respond to some to... of Kirodi, I'm, I'm, I apologize if I'm pronouncing your, your name wrong, incorrectly. So she had a question about the percentage of fishing of fisheries industry uh, using ocean or coastal modeling contributions. So, Mainly the main function I'll think of right now is weather forecasts, which are mainly fed you or produced using uh, some of the ocean or coastal modeling together with satellite data. So every fisherman uses that to have a forecast before they go out, how the weather is looking like, is it going to be windy, how the ways is it safe for them to be out there. So that's the kind of indirect use and I do not know of any direct use of them using the models for their fishing operations other than the end product, which would be the weather forecast or predictions from, from, such, uh, from such models. And the next one about GIS, that would be mainly special management. So that we're using GIS to have blocks with uh, special management where fishers or fishermen can fit fish in a particular area and for that to work and also for us to monitor them if they're not fishing in protected areas or prohibited area, GIS kind of related in terms of use. That's when we are able to use that to be able to monitor with also vessel monitoring VMS and track where the industry or most of the fishing vessels are going. And that is the, the use that we currently have for GIS uh, that I can think of in fisheries management. Funny, so thing, funny, thank you very much. Kerry, I have to go to um, 
Regan James after you. So so after you've responded, I'm actually gonna open actively so that we can have Regan James, who's been patiently wa waiting for an opportunity. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I just briefly wanted to uh, touch on something that Fanny said, which is like, is science enough? And um, and I don't think science is enough. And just to answer some of my, one of my own questions, which is what do we need to do? And I think we need to build uh, stronger relationships across this chain um, and in this human ecosystem and better understanding between the different role players. So uh, through events such as this, but also other mechanisms, I think it's the, the stronger relationships and under shared understanding that we need. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kerry. Um, I, I'm glad that the panel actually dealt with quite a few of the questions that were in the chat. Uh, I, I'd like um, to have uh, that interaction, uh, some engagement where we, we have the audiences ask questions. We have students, we have some members of uh, the community here, uh, and we may not necessarily know all the designations. Uh, but Regan James, over to you. You can actually now unmute your mic. Please, thanks. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chief Regan James. I belong to Katsukur and Royal House. I'm also a traditional line fisherman and also in the West Coast Lobster Lobster. Then I'm also working with various communities in the West Coast, in, in the Western Cape. Yes, I belong to some organizations talking about small scale fisheries. Um, from my side, uh, I heard what you guys are talking about, but I just have some questions. How is uh, the various departments going to help the fishers, especially the boat owners? And like in this season, was past, this past season, we just left with, with, this, with the snooker. Run. A lot of our uh, boat owners didn't, how can they can manage the, in the season? So from my side, I don't know how you people are going to help us as the local fishermen in the various small communities in the Western Cape. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chief Regan James. Um, of course, we, we let's take a few of those questions. Um, your question was more to departments that may be there and uh, we may have someone who have as a, a, a reaction to that. Faiz, you, you did have your hand raised initially, so. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, much appreciated. Uh, so I'm um, um, from a fishing family in Cork Bay, the oldest uh, traditional fishing harbor in, in Cape Town, uh, South Coast, and um, five generations on. Um, our families created the lobster sector, offshore sector. So we've been part of the development of the sector and been in the scientific working groups. Uh, so, from myself, I, I take a, a keen interest in the science uh, because a lot of the decisions over the decades has directly impacted on our lives. Some decisions, unfortunately, were very, very misguided and resulted in, in severe consequences to our fishers. And that's what happens in science sometimes, unfortunately. And we have to recognize that scientists are humans as well. And some, unfortunately, they, they act on their biases and science can also be used as a tool to get a specific outcome that your group wants. So we, un we, we know more or less the scientists involved in the Cape, who they belong to, which associations and what kind of agendas they are, whether they're super conservative, uh, environmentalist, they about fishers or they're not about fishers and more about the environment. So we do understand the different groups and who's there for the fishers. So from our side as a fisher, what's very important and, and, and it's important also to have this discussion while you have the panelists on here. So SASI, for example, right, says that they do this rigorous um, peer reviews and all these scientific terms and they're part of the, the scientific working groups. But in actual fact, and you pointed on a chair and you asked very poignant question, how reliable is their data? And it is not reliable, simply because 
the the scientific department is under budgeted for their for their for their um for their research right and butterworth them they explain this how far their research can go on top of that you highlighted the most important fact climate change and sea level rise and changes in our environment is the biggest factor moving our species around from its historical patterns and we as fishers i'm a skipper myself for example in the lobster sector just to give you an idea how inaccurate the assessment is of lobster on sassy's list so sassy goes with the department's recommendation of tac right and abundance but they don't there's there's absolutely no science that we know that's actually investing their money, WWF included, or anyone in the actual climate change and how it's affecting resources. The department scientists, they say it themselves, they, they don't have the budget to do that, but it's a big impact on the actual resource itself. So what we have today, right, is science that is under budgeted, right, making decisions that impact the lives of ordinary fishers. For example, putting lobster on the red list when you assuming that it's only overfishing and poaching that's affecting the stock and not the actual patterns. So that uh, decision to put lobster on the red list without a comprehensive uh, study on the, the patterns and the changes has affected the financial returns on fishers. So I, I don't see how Sassy can say so confidently and, and stand behind their data and their decision that impacts our lives as fishers because we don't get the returns we need. Then on the abalone of course, Tatu, uh, this is very important, please, Chief. So Tatu, if, if you don't mind, like on the socioeconomic side, um, on the abalone farming, can you please maybe uh, explain to us maybe what value is produced uh, maybe on a hundred ton farm that I and Jay them have, because we know the big companies have lots of farms. And also why that's important, Che, is because the current structure, and you, you need a socioeconomic scientist on here, because social science is now a part of science. And the current makeup of, of uh, fishing rights is still skewed towards big companies that have massive capital investment to operate these farms and establish these farms. So for example, INJ is a massive company that's listed and that has shareholders, probably international uh, um, um, investors that are benefiting from uh, a farm in South Africa where fishing communities don't benefit. So we need to also discuss the socioeconomic makeup of the, the, the system today uh, on the backdrop of dwindling and declining resources. So I just wanna also finish on my last point that science is based on funding. This is important for everyone to understand that's listening. Science is based on funding. If I can pay a scientist to do research that can achieve a result that I want, they will do it. Science doesn't do pro bono. They don't, doctors do it. Scientists, they don't work unless they are paid. So be careful who pays scientists to do certain things because they will achieve the results that the, the person that's funding that wants them to achieve. So thanks again for the opportunity. Much appreciate the platform. I mean, no disrespect to anyone on the panel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Puchenpul. I uh, take serious the, the points that you are making, and I think uh, they come with quite a lot of insight uh so it appears from where i sit on 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 just listening to your views i would have actually wanted to ask you um in in your opinion what would make uh a really uh you, you don't have to answer me because i want to take i just want to leave this with you at the at the moment and then i'll, I'll go on to the next person who must ask the question but i wanted to leave this with you what would make uh, um, a study or, or maybe a, you know the, the type of information that some of the initiatives base their um, uh, uh, work on, what would be a, a valid 
scientific study for you. But uh, I, I want to go to Tanya now. And I think um, Faiz, uh, uh, you, you uh, please understand me. I just really appreciate for me and, and many of the students that are here um, and maybe other members of the public would see your view as someone who has really concluded on many for whatever reasons, but they also want the benefit of both sides to make their own objective, uh, you know, views on the information. So we thank you for yours. I would have just wanted to know what best would fit your your um, opinion, you, you know, your kind of uh, study. Let me go to Tanya uh, Duba who had her hand up as well. Thanks. All right, thanks, Thomas. Um, I would have thought maybe you were going to allow some answers for some of Mr. Faez's um, questions to, to the panel. But um, yeah, maybe that's still coming up. Maybe they just wrote well, it down. Will. Okay, so I, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, one, I wanted to ask Fanny or Apiwe, since they are in the Department of Environment, for, Forestry and Fisheries, if um, I think Fanny made a point about, um, you know, him as a researcher and the work that he does to um, make recommendations to, to the managers in terms of um, what should be caught and what should be not and to make sure that, you know, uh, fisheries are sustainable and that, you know, we, we still have some for the future as well. And his work is mostly... Um, the biological side of things. And he did mention other objectives that they have at the department, the economic, the social, um, and the political. Um, but the, the surveys that they do um, at sea, for me, I mean, assessing the fish stocks, that speaks more to the biological um, objectives of making sure that um, the, the managers are informed in terms of what decisions to be made um, when it comes to sustain, sustaining um, fisheries. So I was just going to ask, is there any research or do you have any colleagues that work on the social, the economic and the political um, objectives um, in terms of making sure that um, sustainability in ocean resources, particularly fisheries is reached. Um, are there any, is there any research along those lines um, or is it just fish stocks and more biological research that informs decision-making and no social or economic or political um, research that also plays part in, in, in making those um, recommendations. And then I also had a question to Mr. Fires, who just spoke. I was interested to hear from him actually, um, what is it that they do um, as fishermen to ensure that um, when they harvest, they do so sustainably? Can he maybe give some of the examples? So I'm assuming that they, they are harvesting sustainably. He can correct me on this. But if my assumption is correct, then can he maybe give us examples of how do they make sure that when they fish, they fish sustainably and they don't take um, uh, too much? Because I think we've learned here that from Kerry, for example, that we need fish to, to mature and to grow um, so that we, 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 yeah, we have more sustainable fisheries because fish are not like humans. The, more, the older they are, the more they reproduce. So we need them to to, to, to grow. So that's the, um, the other question that I had. And then I had a question also for Peps for, for, for SARS because I think this question fits their work because um, they work with uh, a broader stakeholder compared to everyone else in, 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 in the panel. Uh, Mr. Clarence mentioned something about Langanas. I think those are middlemen between the fishermen and um, the, the, the people who, 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 who sell fish. In terms of cutting the middleman and assisting fishermen to get value for money, I mean, value for, for fish, is there any work that you are doing? Because I think the problem might, might be 
uh, the, um, I, 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 I stand to be corrected on this as well. Fishermen will tend to fish more because what they're getting for their value for for their fish is not enough. So for their so for them, getting more fish means more money, and perhaps cutting the middleman and everyone else in the supply chain would bring them. Um, closer to what the value of the fish is and therefore they would not need to fish more because they're getting the actual value for the fish that they 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 need so is there any work in 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 in, in your supply chain um area or element of sassy um sassy's work that works around that um yeah thank you uh thank you uh tanya I, Chief Regan James, I noticed that you still, you, ha you have your hand up and um, sadly it's, it's, we had not necessarily given an opportunity for your initial question or, or, or points to be addressed. So also because we, we're working within a limited time and I'm sure if we had this type of webinar must have services or maybe a uh, you know, go through quite a long time and so on. So, so I, I apologize, I'm not gonna come back to you now, but because I'm looking at the clock and you could put, if you would like, please, your question on the chat as well. Uh, some of the reactions to the points have been made on the chat by the panelists. The third round is actually a round that we give for panelists to give, um, or highlight things that they would really want to highlight, uh, plus uh, also to give us take home messages. And I think if we continue the discussion, which is important, we would run out of time and we won't get uh, the structure of today's webinar. And there are many things that have, I'm, I'm hoping that the points that Tanya has put across can be addressed in those closing remarks. And 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 Faiz and uh, and others and some of the things that are in the chat as well. I do have a bit of an echo, but um, in so in the third round, what we are going to do now is I'm going to start with Mr. Clarence Daniels, and as I go through the list of the panelists, I'm hoping that they would then address some of the things that are outstanding from the chat and uh, some of the points that have been put across already. And, and, and that would be uh, it. Uh, so Clarence Daniels. Is Clarence still here? Yes, I am. Oh, great. Clarence, this is how I would like us to, um, you know, put things, or how do I put this really well? You know, this is an, uh, an opportunity that you're getting as a person who grew up in Hout Bay, in a fishing community. And we've heard from you that uh, there's been so much uh, that are your own experiences that may that formed your story. You decided to pursue a life or uh, a career in marine science. Um, what meaning has your upbringing had for you as a marine science student? There are many of them also here in the call. So for me, it was all about sustainability. And when I started school, I, everything was, was different and I didn't know like what happened. I just saw boats going out and people coming back, people making money. And I wanted to know more and I wanted to gain knowledge because I, I was a guy of it education and academics always. So I wanted to link my academics with, with my community. And I came to this career, Marine Science, and I wanted to be a 
chemical oceanographer because I wanted to see how the chemistry influences the resources and fish species around the area where I live. Thanks, Clarence. Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, any um, take home message for the audiences here? Remember, the audiences here, you may have heard from some people already uh, fishermen, some members of community, people who are interested in this type of uh, uh, webinar. There are some students here. Um, yeah. Any take home message? Yeah, what I, what I can say is as a take-home message is this, that uh, we as, as marine science scientists and community fishermen, we all need to work together and put our heads in together because we all play a vital role. There's, there's a lot of scientists that, that can that sit on land that doesn't go like the fishermen every morning, fishermen goes and they see different changes. Scientists doesn't see that key changes that the fishermen see. And also the scientists see different perspective than the fishing community. So I think it's best if we come together and, and work together and brainstorm around the thing so we can make better decisions for, for future reference. Hmm. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Kerry, I'm going to come to you uh, for your closing remarks, uh, and I want to appreciate the fact that you've taken time to answer some questions that were in the chat. Um, amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. I was, I was actually just responding on the, on the GIS aspects, and I thought it was important to mention the role of marine spatial planning. And South Africa has got a new marine spatial planning. Um, it's got new legislation and it's gonna be rolling out marine spatial plans. And I think one of the really important things to get right in, in this work is um, to properly include the, the spatial data sets, the maps of where people fish, all the different types. I mean, South Africa is really blessed with a an enormous diversity of fishing cultures and fishing methods from the Songa fishes up in Cozy Bay to um, Indian fishing communities in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, fishes at Titicama and on our, on our south coast, uh, traditional harvesting by Koza and Isizulu people and then and our west coast fishes and and maybe even much further back than this. So um, I think that to get all of these perspectives into our planning is really is really going to be important and that that's one of the the other areas so i was speaking about relationships um, i think that in fisheries management and including in the area where i'm involved marine protected area design we need to improve our processes to engage stakeholders you can hear back uh, the frustration of fishers who often don't feel heard um, and even the frustration of scientists who sometimes don't feel heard. So I think it, it's about um, getting all of us to work together, as, as Clarence was saying, uh, for, for the good of the oceans and for the good of the people. And there's so many benefits that we, we get from healthy fisheries. So we can have our work cut out for us. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kerry. That was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really great to get that, uh, you know, the wisdom of the work that you've done and how it can help us. Um, and yes, you are right, Clarence mentioned some of these things. Muzamo just said that he's sorry he's had a, a very poor connection, but I'm just, I just wanted to check with you. Are you, are you, are you able to uh, do your um, final remarks, Muzamo, even if you just want to add a few things you didn't have a chance to? Okay, um, 
Uh, Apiwe, do you want to make your final uh, remarks, sir? Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, well, I don't have uh, many words that I can say here, but I think um, if I may just... You, you just spoke away from the mic now. Uh, just, yeah, come again. Okay. Uh, I was saying, Chair, I think it's important to, to note the fact that one of... Um, of the barriers that we are currently faced with in, uh, in our country are the uh, regulations, be it marine reg regulations, but the regulations that that changes continuously. Uh, we cannot we cannot run away from the very fact that uh, some of these things they work for the good and sometimes for the bad. So it's important to 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 us as the department and to to our stakeholders as well to understand that um, by all means the, 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 the effort or the means is to, it is to correct or it is to improve uh, the fishing industry. So from my side, I think working together and, 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 and try, trying to understand one another there and there, I, I think that's something that uh, we can actually try and improve and, and so that you know when you when we hear about um uh, things that are happening outside and we, we are not so sure or we, we are not even aware of some of them so it's not right so it's well, what i'm trying to say is the fact that um there needs to be more communication between the government authorities and and the the, the industry the fishing industry as well and, and by, by doing so, that will immediately help us to, to get rid of such uh, of some of the uh, errors that have, that, have appeared, that have happened in the past. All right. Thank you so much for that, Apiwe. Um, there was a reaction to what Muzama would have spoken to as a fisheries observer. And I think we, we, we really miss that aspect, uh, that um, the life of a fisheries observer and what it, go, what it does every day um, and the risk of his work, and, but also the great days, you know, in working with the crews and the scientists and in the various uh, expeditions that may be there. Uh, but Umzamo, uh, yeah, sadly it didn't work out well for us today. Mr. Clarence Smith, uh, I would like to come to you, sir, for your final thoughts and just really um, your, just your hopes going forward. Thanks. Yeah, Thomas, thank you. Um... Yeah, on the 9th of June, uh, I submitted the document personally at the office of the Minister of Fisheries. I submitted uh, a 16-page doc document addressing the plights and gripes and fears and problems of the local fishing communities. And to come back to Tanya's question of the middleman, which is the langana, the fishmonger, that all that is, those issues were addressed. And we asked the minister to, 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 to look at avenues where, the, where she or her office can assist us in opening doors or knocking on, on various state-owned entities' doors to assist us in our plight. Because we, um, I also uh, sent that same document to the Minister of Public Works. To date, she never, the Minister of Public Works never responded to that email. And um, our main concern was that 
the Minister of Public Works is, is, is busy with projects on a harvest, all harvest to, de to destroy and break down infrastructures, which the local communities, fishing communities could have used to their advantage, where catching, offloading, transport, holding facilities, processing, marketing, and exporting infrastructure could have been to the advantage of the local communities. To date, the Minister of Public Works never responded. The Minister of Fisheries Office never responded on the, the comeback that they promised that they're going to compile uh, a document which uh, contains every aspect of my document that I submitted to see how they can assist the local communities because we are still in these days addressed as interim relief beneficiaries and small scale beneficiaries. However, the main role players in the fishing sector, sector in the fishing industry, and I don't want to sound racist, but the fact is that it's mainly foreign white nationals. And they dominate the market. They dominate the sector. And we as the local fishing communities, we don't have any rights to quotas in any species viable, sustainable to sustain a community. So the middleman where the, the, the fishmonger or the langana is concerned, he unfortunately at the end of the day, when we come in with our ski boats, with our load of fish for the day, you have no other option but to submit to the, to the Langanas, whether he gives you 10 rand or 50 rand or 5 rand or 15 rand for per fish, that is what you're gonna have to accept. Because at that time of the day, you don't have to go out and go find buyers to buy your catch for the day. And all these infrastructures, which the Department of Public Works is breaking down, it could have been well used it could have been well used by the local communities. And as the minister of the advisors of the minister of fisheries has promised that they will send us contact details and open up, open up doors for us so that we can sustain ourselves so that we can get access to, 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 to finances to sustain ourselves and to re-erect these infrastructures. They never came back since the 9th of, 9th of June. So um, I ask that um, whoever is on this panel, whoever is listening, whoever is, 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 is commenting from, 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 from home, that um, you know, this is a, 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 a very serious concern for local communities. Our communities, fishing communities are dying while the foreign nationals who is dominating the market are flourishing. Thank you very Thank you, much, Ms. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, uh, let us now go to, or oh, in fact, before I come to you, Pevs, uh, Zodwa is a student, as I understand, a uh, side student in sec third year. And I do want to give her, uh, and I could be wrong, an, an opportunity real quick. She said her hand raised and it would be the first time she speaks. Zodwa? Quickly. I'm just bending the rule here, Zodwa. You have to unmute and put your question across real quick or comment. Okay. Yeah, uh, I see Zodwa is probably struggling to, maybe the hand was not raised for a question. I will assume. Perhaps? Your um, final thoughts. Thank you. Well, oh, thanks, Thomas. I think you know, Kerry uh, is. I was jotting down notes for final thoughts, and I think Kerry has, has captured a lot of it in terms of us working collaboratively from the fisher to the consumer. But at the same time, all of us owning and taking responsibility. 
and acting in a responsible manner, whether we are a fisherman or whether we're a consumer. And I think that's partly a very important way of actually safeguarding our resources. And the ocean is under constant pressure. It's not just uh, climate change. It's not changing weather patterns. It's illegal fishing. It's fishing, fisheries that's not properly managed. It is climate change. It is pollution. So all these multiple pressures are on those species that are for human consumption and for livelihoods. And I think we need to honestly recognize that and keep that integrity of that ecosystem is what we're working towards so that we can have uh, seafood in, you know, into the future and we can sustain the livelihoods of fishes, but also a host of other industries that depend on seafood. And I wanted to end a little bit on, on Tanya's question. You know, one of the things that we're trying very hard at WWF is to try and give market access to fishers, um, particularly small scale fishers. It's one thing, uh, you know, I think, Clarence mentioned it. It's one thing being able to catch fish. It's another thing being able to get the worth that that fish is. So trying to develop strong avenues of market access into formalized markets like your retailer programs, um, you know, so that you'll get a fisher can get what his fish is worth, um, you know, and, and also build, I believe, strong market support and strong demand for what is sustainable seafood, um, you know, not market support for species that are of concern. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you very much, Pevs. Uh, your contribution has been amazing throughout. Um, let's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure here who I've missed now. Uh, I've had most of the panels, I think. Uh, yeah, we, we did have a challenge with Umzamo's connection, but he has replied to some of the, the at least related issues. Tato, your last, your last uh, remarks. Um, yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, I think I would have had a different message, but I think it's changed a bit seeing um, some of the conversations around here. And um, a lot of these things revolve around the local fishermen feeling left out of these resources. Uh, so this has been a con this is a conversation that's been going on for quite a long time to tr to try and get them to benefit from the resources. So what I would what I would suggest to them is um, I think what what we normally want as communities is to see government getting involved in these issues and trying to help and get these communities to uh, to benefit from these resources. But right now uh, I think everyone can see that the government is under quite a lot of stress, uh, under a lot of financial pressure. We have corruption, we've got the social needs of our people. So we have quite a lot of these things going around. This is not something that we want to hear, but it, this is stuff that is happening. Um, so don't expect quick reaction from the government. So what I would suggest to these communities is the one way, for instance, of eliminating these langanas that Mr. Smith is complaining about is for greater collaboration between these communities. Just try to get rid of them and you can do that by doing one thing. Come together, set up your own fish um, stores whenever it's, wherever it's possible. So if you can come together, is these communities, wherever you get your fish from, from there, it doesn't go through the middlemen. You have your own fish stores and that way you have direct access to the market. It might not be a big share of the market, but it, it is something that could make a difference if you can that way eliminate the langanas. Um, but the other thing I wanted to, to address quickly, Thomas, and this is off topic now, is um, just want to, to put it out there. I'm not here as a representative of INJ, an employee of the company, but I'm not here to represent the company. I and I wanted to address Fai's um, concern, saying in, in which he said he, he, that um, so these companies like ING are huge companies who come um, with these big foreign investors and benefiting from the local resources and um, without the local communities getting and getting nothing from that. And I want to, to say from my perspective, that is not exactly the case. Uh, I think um, ING, you're seeing how big it is, it is a company that contributes quite significantly to the local communities. There are hundreds of people from Cape Town that work for INJ. INJ also has quite a big footprint um, in terms of the social impact that it plays in those communities. Um, so that I'm not here to represent INJ again, but that is just uh, my opinion on the matter. 
Thank you, uh, Tato. Um, we, 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 we're totally running out of time, but there was just one last thing that I didn't want us to leave uh, not addressing. Uh, and it could be, um, could have been uh, slightly addressed. Uh, Lizette had a question earlier on that said, should foreign fishing vessels not be limited more in terms of permits in order to assist local fishermen so that they be loved woods can be protected. And uh, I think what we don't have here, while a pure place in a space of the administrators linked to the managers, uh, we, we don't have the person who is best placed to actually address this one. Um, Apiwa, if you have a reaction, otherwise um, I, I need to go to Fanny as the last of the panelists. Please, there is a link uh, in the chat about the evaluation just to uh, give your uh, idea as to how this has gone. Apiwa? Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think I've uh, tried to chip into that just a little bit, but uh, going straight to, to your question, um, the foreign vessels are not allowed to harvest or to catch uh, in our easy. Uh, it's only whereby, because obviously our fishermen, some of them, they cannot uh, find boats to harvest their stock. So therefore, they would request um, uh, the department allows them to, to look for other alternatives, meaning they the boats in Mozambique. And then obviously they will have to, 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 to apply and, and submit all the documentation to the department. But it's, it's, it's not possible for, for them to catch in our uh, water only those that have been uh, requested by our local uh, fishermen. Meaning if, if, for example, I do not have a boat, then I ask uh, other countries to assist me in terms of uh, borrowing me a boat. It's only those. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we're not gonna cover everything. And there may be some things that come from, you know, some of the responses. Just time is the enemy. Funny. Uh, I'm not sure if I had not given you an opportunity to do your closing remarks. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I will, in the interest of time, I'll keep my closing remarks short. And all I will say is that where there is a will, there's a way. If we all believe that we can do something towards improving the sustainability of our stocks and our fisheries and the marine <clears throat> ecosystem in South Africa, it, all it takes is our will. I can hear many people from uh, the questions asked and, and the talks given were all passionate about conserving our ecosystem. And we, all we need to do is to get together as, as has been said and uh, work together towards achieving that goal. So that would be my closing remark. And in answering Tanya's qu question quickly, so, there are there is economic risk, social economic research going on, not necessarily done by the department. The guys at UCT are doing some of the social economic uh, research, and uh, Astrid Ja and her colleagues are doing that research. And, and in terms of the industry itself, there's competition and all of that. So they're very uh, secretive or I don't know if secretive is the right word, but they are they are very they keep their uh, books close to their chest and they don't want to share such information. So hopefully in the near future I'll be able to do such research and be able to have an idea of how the economics are doing in South Africa. Thank you, Thomas, and I would like to thank everyone and uh, hope yes. you all keep well and stay safe. Thank you, thank you, Fanny. In the interest of time, we are totally aware that the fisheries or the fishing sector is quite contentious and uh, but we, we really wanted to open a platform for conversations for the purpose of learning or, or just really making it an educational platform and understanding science, the role of science in it and, and, and uh, also in the same way understanding the pressures that the fishing community have from all sides and uh, we have had all of that this evening.
I want to thank the panelists for um, taking time to come and make input and offer uh, all the wisdom they have and the expertise, you know, from the expertise and all the work that they do in the different sectors or, you know, the roles they play. Thank you so much. Um, I, I could not have been an easy um, decision to make to come and uh, address or, or, or give a view, you know, we, we, we do need uh, to note that the bottom line here was if we could work together and um, have, it, you know, various role players have input, it could perhaps be one of the solutions. Uh, but um, this was no, this was no uh, webinar that was going to, uh, bring all the solutions to potential challenges in the fishing industry. Uh, I don't think we would have been that naive to think, but, but it was an educational platform and it helped us take a step ahead. And I wanna thank the contributors, in the audience, people who have asked questions and uh, made comments, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to all of you. Um, uh, my, my work is done and I'm going to give over to the coordinator of the science engagement program who is going to do the closing uh, um, who's going to do the closing of this, the, the webinar. Thank you so much. Kogi, over to you. Thank you, Thomas. Good evening to all our guests. On behalf of SEON, we would like to take this opportunity to pass our sincere gratitude to our esteemed panel Mr. Clarence Smith, Mazambo Makweba, Dr. Fani Shabangu, Professor Kerry Sink, Mr. Apiwe Nokazana, Mr. Tato Tikaledi, Mrs. Paspale, Clarence Daniel. We really enjoyed your wonderful and thought provoking insights into fisheries and its relationship to sustainable use of resources. We would like to thank our partners, the Department of Science and Innovation, the South African Agency for Science and Technological Advancement, SASTA, for your support in this National Science Week event. We would like to thank our guests for being a great audience and engaging the panel in the courageous questions that you asked. My sincere gratitude to Thomas Mtonzi for brilliantly not only directing this program, but conceptualizing the program for today. We would also like to express our profound gratitude to the SEON um, Ekagasini Node and the SEON Science Engagement Team for all your contributions in making this uh, National Science Week event a success. We thank you again everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Be safe and take care.